Brian, thanks for that awesome intro. And uh, I'm excited to have the inaugural session such as it is about CTF data. Um, so Dave and I, um, during the session, we're, we're texting back and forth. We decided to put this, uh, put these two pieces together, the CTF um, overview on, on Userland CTF particular, and then dynamic translators. I think they're gonna flow together. We'll kind of see how it goes. Um, this is definitely not a presentation. We are leading a discussion, so we expect um, when you guys have your laptops open, it's because you're uh, working on the demos that we've talked about, or tweeting the scintillating things that we're saying, <laughs> um, not that you're working on something else like your email, right? Everyone with laptops open? Okay, great. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, you know, we're talking about usually in CTF, thought I'd give a little overview on, on what is CTF, um, and why would we want it usually in, um, just for, for the uninitiated. So CTF, as Brian mentioned, is the way that, um, is the compact C type format. It's the way that Dtrace um, processes uh, C types and the way it uh, kind of extracts type information from the kernel unless you find your own type information. So I, I, first I thought I'd show a little bit about what the kernel types are. So if I run mdb minus k and I use the colon colon uh, print d command, I can print say, um, whole FD type, which is everyone's favorite simplest type. Um, and that shows me just a structure with, with some stuff in it. Or I can do something like proxy, which is a structure with a lot more stuff in it. So um, the C type information is something we introduced in Solaris 9. I should say, wait, but it's really something that Mike and Brian introduced in, and, and Matt Simmons uh, introduced in Solaris 9. Uh, it was initially, um, ostensibly, a facility for, for doing, for just for doing um, debugging post-mortem. So before um, CTF data, if we get a crash, <coughs> you have to find meticulously the exact uh, header files from which the kernel crash dump came from and kind of match them up. Um, with Solaris 9, we encoded all of that type information into the kernel. So when you get a crash dump, all that type information came along for the ride. Now, um, really, this was all just a precursor to DTRAS. Really, this was all part of the master DTrace plan, but it, it has some other benefits along the way. So in Solaris 10, we started putting all of this stuff in user land as well. So if I now do mdb minus p of my bash shell, um, and I do a clone clone print again of uh, whole fd, so we have all of that information uh, in user land as well, just demonstrating that we, what CTF data is. Um, so if I do an elf dump of lib, uh, libc, you can see down at the bottom, we have something sunwctf, so it's, it's built into these binaries. It's built into every kernel module, into every library that's in a libus, um, and a bunch of commands as well. So that's what ctf data is. So when you're writing your dtrace program, and I say, you know, dtrace minus n, uh, let's write a script. If I do, um, you know, if I have type, if I say, if I have a foo equals um, pull fd t star whatever zero, and I say trace fd points to event, that's using CTF data. Um, so. This is all great for kernel stuff, but as we've identified, um, it's a real pain in the neck for, for user land. We don't have any access to the user land CTF. So what we'd like to be able to do is for our programs, which are examining user level processes, be able to dereference pointers, be able to have access to those types and have all of those be expressed within Dtrace. Um, so uh, today, instead, we have to include header files from our programs, um, which is a real pain in the neck. Um, and we have to um, use copy-in to access all of these things. So the way, the way, kind of the straw man for how usually in CTF data might work is um, that we pull out the, the CTF data that's in your usual land containers. So um, either that means you, every time you're using kind of the PID provider, it would uh, go pull out the, the CTF containers, um, or more likely, if you're using dtrace minus p or minus c, people have used dtrace minus p or minus c. Okay. So dtrace minus p or minus c gives you the dollar, dollar target, and we could pull that in as a uh, all of those CTF containers so that we could do kind of magical things like um, automatic copy in every time you dereference pointers. Now, um, that's is, kind of, is the idea there that you would, you would be able to constrain 
it to know that you're only tracing this one program, so it's just it's CTF data rather than like you're saying PID whatever and then PID some other number. You have two different sets of yeah. There, there, right. There are two ways to do it, as Matt Aaron's was saying. Um, either if we had you know you specify a bunch of probes and you say PID one two three, um, and then somehow Dtrace would need to know that that means go grab process one two three and pull in all of its type information. Um, if we constrain it to just look at, and, and there's a lot of Im implicit stuff there. Like for example, if we run the uh, NFS v4 provider, we have to know that we're not pulling in process ID four. Um, don't look into it too much, but there's some nasty hacks today to even make that differ differentiation. That was not the elegant way. Uh, uh, yeah, not the elegant way. I, I don't know what that elegant way is, but it wasn't that. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you if you specify minus p or minus c, at least we have. We'll say, great, we have, so right now there are um, a couple of uh, D container, uh, D CTF containers. Um, so uh, if there's a type dis, uh, in, disam, or, uh, ambiguity, you can disambiguate it um, using some arcane um, uh, syntax. So I'll, I'll show this off. Uh, I think it even works. Wow. Um, <laughs> wow, is right. <laughs> so, this is not double tech, it's something else. No, this is just single tech. Right, so, if, so if I do, if I trace, I, so there are, uh, the kernel has a definition of an int, and so does dtrace. Let's see if this works. <laughs> um, so I can say get dtrace's type, and I can trace uh, an int that way. Or I can use the kernel's version of it and trace it that way. Now, it turns out int is, is int is int, uh, but if in my D program I specified a type, I created a struct called pullfd, that was a totally different thing, uh, these two, these two guys would collide. People with laptops open. I assume you're testing this out. Um, so what we could do um, is invent another top-level container, maybe something like U, since we, um, you know, Dtrace is very K-centric, uh, as you might have noticed, um, or something like P for like user land process or something like that. So create another container which pulls in all of that type information and gives you access to it. To it, you can disambiguate it um, that way. Would we want to just call it pit whatever pit dollar target as a container? You, know, that's going to you mean something like like pit dollar target pit dollar target? So that it would be so it would effectively be pit one two three as right. target. Yeah, sure. That that would be another way to do it. Um, was that a question over there? Yeah. yeah. Are ambiguities in the same in the same CTF? Data? Yeah. In fact, we you might have that today in different kernel modules. So today, uh, again, in theory, you could do something like um, gen. Backtick. Uh, Odds of this working? <laughs> oh, oh, no. Oh, it's just Gen Unix. It's just Gen Unix, you see. Really? Yeah. No way. Pretty sure. Pretty sure. How about that? All right. So uh, we'd have to invent some way of disambiguating. So like your, um, if you if you have a, you know a, C uh, a type in your user run program in libc and in your own library or whatever, and those collided, you have to specify it that way. So there there are different ways you need to disambiguate it. Um, it would. It wouldn't be that part. Wouldn't even be that much of a mess. Uh, the CTF already has this um, hierarchical notions of containers, so we could specify which uh, CTF container you're talking about. Um, that part really not that you know, mess. That seems like a mess. Um, I mean, just in terms of like, because it seems like it seems likely that you're going to have type complex within a program. Yeah, that the, you know, yeah. CTF lookup kind of makes that not so bad. Like you, you look up what container you're talking about. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think that would be horrible. But um, what, you, what you then need to do is, um, there are places where it gets super duper nasty. So if you say something like, um, let's talk about longs. So if you're tracing a 32-bit program and a 64-bit <laughs> kernel, not, which is Brian, it's not the other way around. But if, if you're talking, you're, you have to figure out like what does your program mean? When you say long, did that mean uh, the uh, the model for the kernel, or does that mean the model for user land? But I, um, when I kind of want to, you know, Dtrace makes all of the bridging of those gaps explicit today. If you're taking something out of user land, we make you copy it in, we make you cast it to something. Um, if you're taking, if you've got some uh, user land type, and you want to, uh, you implicitly copy it in, but then assign it to your Dtrace variable, um, whose object model is 64 bit or something like that that gets super messy. Let's say your process execs in the middle of it. 
I have no fucking idea how that would work. So all, all of a sudden, you've got a huge pile of new CTF containers that just showed up. <laughs> and you've got your DTrace program, which you had compiled previously. It might be that your DTrace program doesn't even compile now, right, after you've done this exec. So, um, or it might be that it's in a different object model. Or it, um, I mean, would we just, at that point, give up? And, I mean, it, it, we don't allow you to exec and use these without CTF. So, like, so, so your so your DTrace program's executing. It doesn't exact. It doesn't exact. DTrace is like, sorry, you shouldn't sure. use, use one CTF. I'm, I'm out of here. No idea what's going on. I'm out of here. Yeah, sure. Back, I mean, is it like better than trying to piece together magic? That, that's true, but you know, then do we make, uh, you, you know, DTrace, I think a fair critique of it that uh, is that it puts a lot of implementation detail right up in your grill. Yeah. Um, so, you know, would we, would we want to have it be implicit, like, I am using CTF containers now because I would like to look at my user land process, or would we like, you know, to Jared's, what Jared's going to say about usability, I'm sure, have it be implicit, like, if you use a user land type, that just works without needing to, like, ask for explicit permission, um, or sign some specific document that says, hey, if I happen to exec, please cancel all of the DTrace recording that I, that I thought that I might have wanted. Um, and it could be that you're trying to trace some pathology across exec. So it, it's, um, that is a real mess. Now, th then the other half of the problem is how do I- You change your data model on exec. Pardon me? You change, you mean, we frequently do change your data model across an exec. Yes, yes, you, yes, it's, it, yes, it's horrible. Uh, horrible. Yes, it's horrible. I mean, almost by definition, you're probably exacting something that's not the same program. <laughs> right, exactly, right? that seems like- <laughs> If you were exacting the same program, why did you do that? The case that you're doing like user bin, Something which is ISA exact to 32 64. Right. ISA exact is 32, and you're probably running a 64 bit machine. So. That's a common for, yes, that, that's very common. I mean, other programs, exact code programs, there, there's lots of different, yes, but that, that is probably the most common like you, use of exact. So, ordinary users might, might not even realize that ISA exact exists, and they're just like, oh, I want to trace, you know, use ISA exact. Whatever. How, how many, many times have you accidentally replaced ISA exact with your own? version of the program. <laughs> 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 Anybody know that? <laughs> yeah. It's like, why is bin true the same as bin false? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, well, I, I mean, given that now the ISOs are pretty well satisfied, and they're like, oh, well, we can just use the ISOs are pretty well satisfied as it's going to be an ISOs before. Why do we need to have ISA, ISA exec anyways? For most programs. <laughs> <laughs> good, good point. Different discussion. Yeah. Death to ISO exec, agree. <laughs> um, but, but uh, you know, there's so different, exactly. different discussion. Um, so, that, so then, uh, you know, this is kind of types in the abstract. Just like if I if I say, great, I know for some, for some reason I have a type from uh, libfu that I or my my a dot out that I made, um, and, I, and I know that that's it. But what we'd really like is to get typed information on on PID provider probes. Uh, we'll defer type information on uh, USDT until the dynamic translator dis discussion because they have some really brilliant insights on that. I don't, uh, I don't, want to, I don't want to give it away. Thank but you. You're going to really be fascinated. Andy has a song and dance number he's been working on. <laughs> um, but uh, the the PID provider, once we have user land types, I think it wouldn't be too bad for if you say, um, you know, some um, some specific uh, PID probe, and, and and know the the types associated with that. Where it gets again super nasty is let's say you um, you're doing PID entry for several different probes and you have a single ECB um, you know as a result of that what what do we do there if you say args one, if you you specify two different probes and you say args one points to foo we'll do kernel will kick you out there I mean we, we won't let we have the same problem with FPG, right so kernel will kick you out depending on the stability right exactly so the kernel will say these things don't but. Yeah, that, you, you can't. You, I mean, it's just a very weird kind of. Okay, so maybe we can limit it just to you've got a single probe. But my question is, how do you actually get that information down into the kernel? As part of, I, mean, the I think we do it not in the kernel. I think we do it statically, <coughs> um, like we do with with types today. With I mean, we do with kernel types today. Today, the way that the the dtrace works is it it ioctals the kernel. Uh, the, so I don't know if anyone's noticed this, but the first time you run dtrace on a system. It actually is a little bit slow. Now, what, what's happening there is DTrace is going downstairs and taking all of those CTF containers, which are gzipped, and ungzipping them, and then pulling them back into user. It's that gzipping activity the first time you ever run DTrace, which takes a little longer than subsequent it, executions. Is, what is ungzipping? Like, 
the the CHF data from the kernel modules? Yeah. Yeah. So the the kernel keeps it's. Because um, everyone knows that DRM is incredibly expensive, um, and it, in 1999, <laughs> and uh, we gzip all of the CTF data that's in the kernel. Maybe that's another thing, Jonathan. You can put on your list to, yeah. of, of things to go execute. Um, but um, we 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 decompress it. So what what happens with DTrace? We pull all the CTF containers into userland and then compile things statically. All of those. Um, all of the offsets into structures, all of the types. The kernel doesn't know at execution time about any of those things. Right, stop me if I'm, if I'm like completely um, high here. But, no, uh, but it does know about the types of the arguments. It, it, it does, for FBT, the kernel actually does know that. <coughs> no, but, but the usually in queries those out. It does query those out explicitly. So, right. it, so it asks the kernel, and I gotta go back and, and pull up this horrible code path. But well, there, there's the, get args um, callback on providers. And pro right. so it's providers can tell you for a different probe, what are the arguments associated with that? Um, and we do something similar. We could, we could either use a similar mechanism with the PID provider or do something crazy. So the way the, PID, the, way the PID provider works, oh boy, how do I get here? <laughs> uh, so the way the PID provider works is, um, I'm sure you've noticed, if you just go on your system, you do dtrace minus l, you see no PID provider probes. And if you start creating them, they're created on demand. Um, what happens is libdtrace will ioctl down to the kernel, uh, in, in particular to um, what's known as the fast trap module, and uh, also known as Mr. Mr. Fast Trap, well, also known as Mr. Sparkle. Thank you. Um, and and ioctl downstairs and, and tell it about all of these new probes on the system. Now, the kind of uh, cleaner way to do it would be to um, tell it not just about the probes on the system, but tell it about the type information. The problem with that is that that type information um, is not associated with any CTF containers that the kernel knows about, and it seems like a really circuitous route to take all the information from user land, jam it down to the kernel, only then to, to read it back out. If we are indeed gonna limit this to only processes that, uh, you know, that the nice thing about that though is if it would enable any random, um, you know, PID one, two, three, random function um, to be able to have some CTF data. If we want to limit this just to minus p and minus uh, minus c, the dollar target use case, then um, we wouldn't have to kind of go that huge circuitous route. Maybe have an alternate mechanism for paid provider probes to go recover the the type information and associate with those CTF containers. And then there's horribleness at usually. Well, use those you know, get some unholy knowledge that doesn't currently have. It has some pretty deep unholy knowledge. Yeah, it no, it, it knows that if I've got some provider. Then and it's and it um, ends in a number, <laughs> but the number's not four forty. And, <laughs> and, and it's not NFS. Breaking the string NFS. Yeah. Um, then maybe I'll go see if there's some USDT probes, or maybe if it starts with the letters PID and then has a number, then I'll go instantiate some probes. Why? It's like I'm naked on stage. It's like I'm, I'm, I'm just like these are all the mistakes I've made in my life. Any questions? <laughs> um, um, but I, I think that if, uh, you know, I think um, previously when we had talked about this, um, or, you know, in, in Dtrace meetings and previous Dtrace.coms, I think we were wrapped up around kind of using the generic mechanism. I think if we used kind of this sideband unholy knowledge, um, it, it might be a little more straightforward. Well, I was thinking with this, it's like we just need to get it working, however awful it is, and then if you want to clean it up, clean it up. It's like, it, yeah. In other words, like, if it, 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 I think you're right, it's not going to be that much worse than it already is in there. I think there, there were two important D-Trace um, tenants that, that served us very well. Um, the first was punt on third down. So as, as soon as possible, <laughs> we would punt problems down the road, and I think that's reflected in, in some of what you've seen in, in D-Trace. Um, the other was don't inhibit us from doing the right thing later, and I think that would be an important principle here, which is let, let's, let's narrow the scope just to dollar target use case, um, and then, you know, Make sure that the the right thing doesn't doesn't get screwed up later on. Um, any other big gaps that I mean, I, I think another big gap on this is is uh, places where we don't have CTF, like um, you know, uh, like dynamic languages, where it'd be nice to have some notion of structured data, um, but there aren't there obviously aren't CTF containers there. I think or that's another discussion. Non dynamic languages like Java. Also, non-dynamic languages okay. like Java. Well, yeah. Well, also, or even C++. I don't know if you have any thoughts on how to get C++ 
into CPF. Okay. I think we can both agree that C++ is the best language of all time. <laughs> um, I think we can all agree. Um, and uh, I, I think that, you know, we, we, I don't think it would be so much of a stretch. Do we have another CTO? Are we talking about C++? Okay. okay. So, I mean, the, so, um, the CTF generation, and, and Dave, I don't need to talk about kind of the work that's going, or Robert, did you mention the, you yeah. want to talk about that? Sure, so the way CTF convert works now is that you get CTF, uh, converted CTF merge from the ON build tools, which is a, basically just a side effect of trying to build Illumos, and you basically have to run, you build a binary with either dwarf or stabs data, depending on your compiler, we then run something called CTF convert on every .o that exists, which basically says take the dwarf data, strip it out, and replace it with CTF data. And then we end up having to merge all that in. So then you then link the binary. You then run CTF merge on the resulting binary or shared object in every .o, which merges all of the CTF data across all those into one container. Obviously, that's a very error-prone process. Uh, it actually doesn't work if you have specific relocations in your .os which aren't going to be resolved until link time. And so work that's been done and is almost done is to do the first pass of this where CTF data, you, instead of having the CTF convert every .o and CTF merge at the end, you can basically build a binary <coughs> with dwarf data, the stabs data, then just run CTF convert on the generated binary or the generated .so, and then that'll do all that process. Uh, the end goal would be to move that into the linker. Right, you move it into the linker or move it into the compiler, right? I mean, yeah, there, that would be, that would, the compiler would be the best place to do that, but that's... Yeah, yeah so we, we figured out how to get off of the, the studio. Mm -hmm. We don't own the compiler, but I mean, the compiler is open source and it's something we, you know, when, when we get to GCC uh, for, for everything, then, then maybe that's the way to go. Uh, I think there are two ways to go with C++ and with these other languages that are even statically typed. One is extend CTF to encompass kind of their, their primitives. I think another way to go is to force them all into the, to, to express themselves as though they were sick. So uh, the distinction between a class and a struct just gets stripped away. And uh, CT, like when you're, when you're doing CTF for C++, um, you just go to the least common denominator. And I think that, that would probably be a, a good place to start. Then if there are places that are really unexpressible, like people have a lot of um, like member pointers and method pointers and like create, Templates. Well, some people actually don't deserve any of instrumentation, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you have a lot of crazy stuff, then maybe we can figure out the ways to extend CTF to accommodate those if those become like really common use cases that are just impossible to express in CTF. I don't know, some people just get started on this. What would be kind of the first step to go take? And like, what would be kind of the first. Uh, Counseling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what would be the first step? Um, I think the first step is to. to Start to mind meld with the compiler um, and and figure out how to just load in those um, those C those containers those um, the yeah the decompiler pardon me and pull in the userland containers which which isn't that hard um, because we you know D Trace already knows about the 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 dollar target um, kind of uh, process so and we already have a uh, libproc handle for that guy. And from that, we can go and grab the CTF containers. We need to figure out how to express those in the in that hierarchy. That's not so, so bad. Now, where I think where it gets really horrible is then what we do with those types. How we, again, how we do the implicit copy-ins, what, you know, they're, um, believe it or not, oh, diff, We've, we didn't mention yeah. diff at all. Um, so uh, one thing I just show is, um, is what diff looks like. So for example, if I do um, D transforms in, begin, and then I'll do uh, you know, um, I equals uh, three plus, whatever, just I plus plus, can I just do that? Minus SC. I just wanted to show what diff looks like. So uh, Brian alluded to diff, which is the D intermediate format. Um, it looks very uh, assembly-like. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but um, in particular, there's, uh, there's load instructions. And believe it or not, Dtrace already has this notion of user land load instructions, which are bridges to nowhere. Um, but we, which are not bridges to nowhere? No, we use them. Th those work? Yeah. Hmm. For what? It's a bridge to somewhere. Uh, we use them, they use them, What generates them? Oh, this is how they generate them? <laughs> <laughs> this is how they generate them. 
There are bridges, they're just not used. <laughs> Yes, you bridges to somewhere that no one goes on. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, am I using the wrong metaphor? All right. I, if you know how to generate one from the compiler, that, that I think it's been, the kernel actually doesn't process them correctly, though. Does it not? No, right, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I mean, it, it probably has code to do that, but it certainly never has executed that code. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're in code, you assume we can execute. You know, <laughs> right, exactly. Um, <laughs> So uh, there, there, there are apparently that they bridge us to somewhere, but but no one's been on them. Um, <laughs> so w we need the compiler to start generating, which I claim that it doesn't, but maybe it does. Uh, user land. I went, how would it? Okay. No, 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 I agree. I'm sure. I'm it sure, it, it needs to start generating user land loads rather than uh, kernel memory loads, um, you know, <laughs> in order to, to kind of process this type of information. And then there are certainly just going to be nasty edge cases there where you need to disambiguate the types um, and and kind of work with the language for, there. For disambiguation, does it make sense to somehow be able to express that this is associated with this path, uh, like the path of the, of the help object? <coughs> yeah, so that's what we were showing earlier. So when we did gen unix backtick, you'd do something similar where you'd say uh, libc.so.1 backtick. Or eight out back that's, to that's what the double back take is today, right? But you probably want more than just eight out back to the user then user bin and user <coughs> No, I don't think so because again you're 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 the, you're within the context of that um of, I mean about the exec boundary, right? Uh, exact boundary is a different edge case, but i think doing an ex like having to fully qualify the path um, for your type, I don't think would be necessary. Today, you can you have a, a similar problem with if you have a if you have um, two different PID provider fun, um, uh, probes named you know two different functions named foo. You can say libc backtick foo colon entry, and you could say uh, you know lib foo backtick entry uh, backtick uh, foo entry. So you can you can qualify them that way. Um, I don't think I guess maybe there are instances where you need the full path if you've got libc.so.1 loaded from two different locations. Um, it, it, I'm, it, yeah, let's not do a show of hands on that. <laughs> you talk about the anti keter mechanism. So the user land can generate, it appears, the um, div op ULBC, LBSC, the, the, the kernel actually does actually execute What generates that. it? DTCG load will do it. If, if DTNF user land is set, and I don't know if that's ever set, but it's like, no, the city is pretty well built. <laughs> There's no way into it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay into, into Brian's Atlantis that he's found. Um, <laughs> completely under the sea here. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, there, I still claim that there's significant amounts of work to be done there. Maybe, maybe Mike has, has forged roads um, to those areas. Um, we got to yeah. go figure out how that works. Yeah. Then, so uh, I think that's not that, I mean, that the, kind of we know, we know from A to B, we know kind of how to get there, but they're definitely going to be nasty edge cases. You stack helpers, they do generate, that's where it does it. Ah, uh, you stack helpers, right, good point. So Brian brings up when you are, are writing like a, a, a U stack helper, like, uh, like J stack uh, for, for Java or from these other languages, that's when we compile that, we generate, we compile that to um, only do loads from user lambda. It's, it, it, the double take is what I'm doing. Uh, right. So if you're looking at a global variable from your user land binary, it'll go. But I'd say this is an edge case. That, I mean, it is executed. You're right. So I was completely wrong. But we do execute this. Um, there's still a lot of work to do here. Yeah. Um, then in terms of getting the, the types for your um, PID provider probes only, um, I think again, this is just building some nasty mechanism to uh, to wedge it in. So this currently, um, libdtrace will ask the kernel what are the t what's the type information for these probes, and we just need to um, bifurcate that code a little bit to say, hey, if this is a PID provider probe, go ask in this direction um, instead of of uh, querying the kernel. So but, just because so the first step would be that I run dtrace minus n minus p whatever. And Dtrace is able to print out using C routines. Hey, I, I know about this Shrock. I, I could use Shrock's, um, uh, you know, Shrock's print uh, action and print out a type that pertained to the user land process. But even before that, just being able to pull it in and being able to, to, to print it out from Dtrace.c, from user source command Dtrace.c. 
be, be able to, to, to pull in the container from the D-trace to be able to know about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and the first step. The first step. And then the next step is then to hook that up somehow with the, the syntactically. Yeah. And and then, and, yeah. And then the next step is to, to get the PID provider <coughs> to tell you about things. Now, I think there's another detour there for getting global variables. Um, Maybe we can already do that today with du double backtick or double something. Double backtick does work. I mean, it's, it's like. But does it work only in the context of JSTack helpers? It only works in the context of USAC helper today. So we we need to you need to wire that up. Maybe that's hard. Maybe that's already done. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of. I think that's kind of. I think it would it would be a surmountable project. This I don't think there's any surmountable raves out of love. <laughs> Technically not impossible. Right. Uh, I, I don't. I think. I think it's um, with, with certainly with just some some hard work and grinding it out in uh, in the libdtrace source space because this is all all in libdtrace all in libdtrace. Um, I think um, you know it, it wouldn't be <laughs> it wouldn't be insurmountable. Um, Probably on the order of a couple months worth of work to get it all working end to end. And then one more question, just maybe because we can talk about this later today, but uh, for the other ports of DTrace, I think because it's all with DTrace and because everyone had the cons up CTF, I think that it would basically be portable to other architectures. Yeah, other OSs. Absolutely, it, it would just it would just work in other OSs. They would, I mean, the 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 head start that we have in Illumos and in Solaris is that all the, all the libraries are built with CTF data as of Solaris 10. And, and so are a lot of just random uh, commands and binaries. Uh, I don't I don't know the case with FreeBSD. I don't know if, um, I, I can't imagine why you do that unless you also have ported MDB, which I don't think you have. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you need to start be able to compile usually at once. Maybe that's another case where building it into GCC would be a really worthwhile project. If, um, uh, GCC for FreeBSD is basically on its way out. You have to be able to be built into Clang. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm I'm way not yet to the planning. Someone has to teach me about that. That's okay. Good. Coming up soon. All right. Um, any other comments about um, CTF for Userland or Userland types? So, so just in, in general, I would like to see. Um, this is not necessarily specific to Userland, but I'd like to see Userland types being used Yeah, that goes to, to Robert's point about there, there's some significant work being done in the tool, tool chain already. Yeah, making CTF um, easier to use and possible to use. Yeah. But even for Carl, even for Carl, I feel like I've done the Carl on the internet as well. I'll say figure out how to use it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pain in the neck. Uh, I think that we've also touched on a couple things to, um, to revisit about it. For example, um, whether it's worth c compressing still. Uh, another question is, um, you know, today we uniquify types against GenUnix because again, DRAM is incredibly expensive in 1999. Um, what that means is we take all the types that were common in different modules and only have them in one place. What that means is if you uh, generate a one-off kernel module and drop it onto your system, um, its types will be crazy because it, uh, it will point to an index for like an int in, in what it thinks is its parent CTF container and instead find a proxy. Um, so, uh, this is super annoying if you're a kernel module developer. So, for example, if you're developing ZFS, this is super annoying. <laughs> All right, cool. Should we transition to? So I have one yeah. final question. If someone did want to get started, would you be willing to kind of? help escort them into the hinterlands? You know, just talking about it has got me all like fired up for this. So uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to, if someone is really fired up for this, I would love to work with them on it or, or mentor them or, or kind of whatever level of participation you're interested in. Um, but, but yeah, if, if there are folks who are interested either here or on the internet, yeah, question. Yeah, a uh, comment on the, um, if you're trying to set up uh, some kind of a, a, a way for a, a, an application process to tell you about its types, um, I would strongly suggest that you set up some kind of conventionalized format in place so that the, the program itself can simply put information into some files uh, someplace. Because um, trying to, you know, if I'm a programmer under Ruby, there's 27 different Ruby implementations, but I could write a library in Ruby that could write some files. So I wouldn't have to wait for MOTS to, to, to put this in. 
So if you want uptake, you should make it easy, as easy as possible for the the application programmers who have an interest in this to actually make this happen. Yeah. So I, I think that's a really good point, but um, you know this is really there's all there's a completely different and more complicated discussion about getting CTF types for these other languages. When you're talking about you know, this conversation is really just focused on C, and if we yeah, I think we'll, we'll talk about that later today yeah. too. So, um, but but that, that's I agree. That's totally that's a, that's a, a tricky problem. But as Brian says, we'll talk about. It.